Bismillah wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah and Nabi al-Kareem. We're going to do a review of everything that we learned so far in the class, insha'Allah, and talk about the final paper. This is an optional bonus lecture. If you don't listen to it, khalas, that's your choice. But if you do listen to it, there will be lots of important stuff here that will help you with your final paper and um, just kind of give you a basic overview of the course thus far to help you remember everything that you've learned. And this is the 12th and final lecture in our series. I will miss you all. Ahlan wa sahlan. Assalamu alaikum ya tullab al -um. I'm going to talk about the Chicago citation style, also known as the Turabian style. Um, these two books here, right here, um, you usually can find PDFs of them on the internet. It might be like an older edition, like 7th edition or 15th edition or you know, something like that. Um, but you could definitely find them as PDFs, so I recommend that you go on look for those if you need more details about how to cite in the Chicago style. The Chicago style of citation is the standard citation method that is used in the humanities and particularly uh, with historians. So historians all over the world use the Chicago manual of style uh, for their citations, which usually takes the form of footnotes. Uh, sometimes they put bibliographies for your final paper, a bibliography is not necessary. In fact, I would rather you did not put a bibliography. Um, footnotes are sufficient. Footnotes will contain all the information that's in a bibliography and often more. Um, and then I'm going to read a little bit uh, some different passages from Hans Kung Islam, Past, Present, and Future, which is translated from German. Um, he's a very famous uh, Christian theologian and Orientalist. Um, his book they call a magnum opus because it's such a such a huge massive book uh, very encyclopedic um, so a lot of the stuff he says is very interesting and doesn't contradict traditional Islamic history so I find it uh, quite a useful uh, reference book um, but anything from an orientalist of course you take with a grain of salt but he has a really good uh, summary of the Khulafa Rashidin in his book so i'm going to read passages of it if you're disinterested or you find this a little boring you can go ahead skip ahead over to the information that i'll give you on using the chicago style of citation anyways to begin with hans king he has a chapter heading who is to lead scarcely was muhammad buried in the house in medina in the place where today his tomb is within the mosque of the prophet then disputes over his successor began on the one hand there were the helpers the ansar of medina who felt disadvantaged by comparison with the meccans whom muhammad had preferred in the distribution of plunder should they simply nominate their own leaders for the warlike actions that were envisaged envisaged on the other hand, there were many Bedouin tribes. They had promised the Prophet ﷺ personal allegiance, but always rejected the efforts of his tribe, the Quraysh, to gain dominance. Should they continue to feel bound to their promise of loyalty after the death of Muhammad? Why constantly pay taxes and permanently perform possibly unpopular religious duties? So an apostasy movement, Ridda, whether with primarily political or religious motivation, began to gain ground rapidly. A decade after the hijra of the community, composed of so many elements, threatened to fall apart. How was this crisis in leadership to be resolved by a new prophet? But such a person could not be seen, either in Medina or in Mecca, was hardly to be expected. According to the Qur'an, Muhammad is the seal of the prophets, Khatam al-Anbiya, though at first seal was not understood as conclusion but confirmation yet efficient leadership was now desperately needed if the community was to survive 
I intend to trace the history of Islam through the four caliphs of Medina, not because I'm overestimating the rulers and neglecting the development of the structures. As I have already emphasized, the concrete history can be comprehensively described only in the dialectic of structures and persons. The factual history of the actions of individuals or contingent individual events does not lie on the surface, but is at the center of historical processes of social history. The question of the prophetic succession is also a question of structures and persons. The companions of the prophet, one might call them the prophet's apostles, he's talking about the Sahaba, were clearly aware of the danger of a split after the prophet's death, the Bedouin tribes apostatized, fell away from the faith, and the old murderous tribal realities threatened to break out again, particularly in Medina. If tribes were once again to choose their own leaders, the smaller tribes and those who had emigrated from Medina would suffer. The consequences would be devastating, so there was pressure to find a rapid solution. The choice of a successor, Abu Bakr, the first caliph. The debate lasted a whole night and was decided that a successor, a representative for Muhammad, a caliph, Khalifa, must be chosen. The choice fell on a man who was one of the first in Mecca to believe in the Prophet's mission, Abu Bakr, radiallahu anhu. Muhammad's father-in-law, the Prophet married his daughter Aisha, he was originally a Qurashi and an immigrant. He had been a friend of Muhammad all of his life and was one of the closest administrative and military advisors. But probably the decisive factor in choosing him was that the Prophet himself had appointed him leader of the farewell pilgrimage and during his terminal illness, leader of the prayers, Imam. So Abu Bakr followed Muhammad in leading the community. His election by a larger group without special authority was ratified the next day by the whole community. In the mosque in Medina, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu simply declared that he wanted to follow the sunnah, custom or example, of the Prophet and as long as he obeyed that, all were to obey him. He had been given the nickname as siddiq the truthful. By all accounts, he was a personally modest, unpretentious man but also capable of energetic action. Now he was concerned not only with the daily ritual prayer and Friday prayer, but also and above all with worldly political matters, law, finances, and the waging of war. It is important for the whole history of Islam that from the beginning in the original community and now also amongst the caliphs, there was no place for a purely worldly authority. The introduction of the caliphate meant that immediate guidance by the prophet as one who received, proclaimed, and carried out divine revelations was replaced by guidance from the prophet's representative, Khalifa. There was no longer a legitimation that renewed itself through new divine revelations. There was only the derived human authority of a non-prophetic leader, no longer a spokesman of God, but at best a conversation partner with God. The institution of the caliphate took the place of the charismatic leader, office the place of charisma, and tradition the place of prophecy. Charismatic rule was legalized, made traditional, and every day. The prophet's representative was not himself a prophet, nor even primarily a religious authority, but a political and legal authority. Something like a supreme tribal sheikh who had to lead the whole Muslim community mediate and make decisions and disputes and assume the supreme leadership. Um, you can already see that there's some problems here where he has a very modern interpretation of all of this. We would, as Sunnis say, no, the Khalifa was also the religious leader of the community. Um, we wouldn't make any distinction between secular and religious. All of it is deen. It's, you know, a different paradigm. So we could see here, uh, modern values espoused by Hans Kuhn. The tasks of the caliph were so new that they had not been laid down, nor is there anything about them in the Qur'an. The word caliph certainly occurs often in the Qur'an, but at no point does it clearly stand for a possible political and religious successor to the prophet in leading the community. 
Surely it isn't surprising that at a very early stage, there was a dispute amongst Muslims about the characteristics and competencies of the caliph and the way of appointing him. However, now Muslims become more and more aware of one thing. Though the Prophet was no longer among the living, the Qur'an remained, alive and indestructible, as the eternal word of God. In these new circumstances, loyalty to the person of the Prophet was replaced by loyalty to his message. Though in Islam, the religious had has a political dimension and the political has religious premises. Two aspects of the succession need to be distinguished. In the political succession, the caliph, as permanent successor to God's messenger, replaced Muhammad the statesman. The caliphate had become an institution which was primarily political. It might be debatable. In the religious succession, the prophet Muhammad was replaced by the Quran, only later brought together as a book, codex, and the example of God's messenger, the Sunnah, there was no supreme teaching, in office, teaching office. In the long run, the Qur'an became the religious authority. The prophet who had brought about this fundamental shift by comparison with the pagan prehistory of ignorance, Jahiliya, thus remained the spiritual leader, the model for perfect ritual and ethical behavior. In the political sphere, though, it was the caliphs who, with their conquests and inner disputes, schisms, drew the guidelines for the future, the eschatological ideas of the Bedouin ideal of freedom, retreated in favor of a structured government, a state, Dawla. Abu Bakr was to be granted a reign of only two years, yet in those years something decisive happened for which the Prophet himself had already prepared. The transition from the desert to the high cultures. If we do not simply take over uncritically the re retrospective aspect, or excuse me, if we do not simply take over uncritically the retrospective accounts of later Muslim historians, according to whom Abu Bakr initiated the conquest by sending out four emirs, the question necessarily arises: How could the amazingly successful campaigns of conquest which now followed have come about? How could a people from a remote desert cities on the periphery of the high cultures all at once possess giant territories of two great empires of the time, Byzantium and Persia? Recent research has shown that the developments within domestic policy led to the advances in foreign policy. The tasks of the caliph were primarily domestic policy and Abu Bakr seems to have tackled them with energy, shrewdness, and consistency. The apostasy movement, Ridda, had to be stopped. The rule of the Islamic community re-established and the true religion of Arabia consolidated everywhere. Evidently, the power of the message of the Quran was not in itself enough to hold together the tribes won over by the Prophet. Military force was needed and indeed, in the future military successes, often helped the message to break through. With a few well-aimed blows, Abu Bakr subjected the apostate Bedouin tribes, enforced the payment of alms, zakat, and established Islam beyond the territories dominated by Muhammad. It would become even clearer in the future that unless the now ruling Muslim elites of Medina and Mecca exercise moderate political control over the Arab tribes, above all the Bedouins, no political inter excuse me, no political integration and no formal no formation of a state would be possible. For these enterprises, the caliph depended on the leadership, qualities, military knowledge, and wide-ranging relationships of the Meccan elite, which a short time previously had been hostile to the Muslims and especially to the Ansar of Medina. However, all now had shared interests in the act of subjection. Thus united, the Muslims de defeated a very hostile tribal Federation in the Battle of Al Aqraba in Central Arabia in 633. These victories had consequences. The subject tribes continued to put pressure on the neighboring tribes and attempted to take advantage of them. The effects could be observed as far as Bahrain and Oman and in the east of Yemen and Hadramaut in the south. An increasing number of tribes associated themselves with the powerful Islamic Confederation which now also conquered rival tribal units which had their own prophets, 
Among the four, there was even a prophetess. So that very soon, all of Arabia was Islamicized. The Islamic Ummah finally established itself as a new Arab order of power. Furthermore, Abu Bakr supported efforts to gain plunder beyond Arabia in Syria, Iraq, and Iran by raids and surprise attacks. In this way, after the battles with Arabia against the apostasy, the Ridda Wars, the Bedouin powers, which had been thus set free, were diverted outwards and especially northwards. What had begun as raids, Ghazawat, against the original tribe soon became a war against the great power of Byzantium which of course could not tolerate such attacks and therefore sent an army to southern Palestine. Abu Bakr sent his most competent general Khalid ibn al-Walid the sword of God, Saifullah from Iraq to Palestine to take supreme command against the Byzantines. For the first time the Arabs were now operating not only as a separate bold fighting squads but also as a real army consisting of many small units. Finally, probably to the surprise of both sides, this army defeated the Byzantine troops at the Battle of Aghnadain in 634. This victory immeasurably increased the enthusiasm for war and the certainty of victory amongst the Arabs. People were no longer content with individual campaigns for plunder. Now they could set out on the conquest of territories previously controlled by the great world powers. Without the two sides really being aware of it, this was to lead to a great confrontation between Islam and Christianity. The original community expands. During the lifetime of the Prophet Muhammad, as we saw, the Quraysh who were the Quraysh who were leading the the Quraysh who were the leading stratum of Muhammad's ancestral city were first threatened with force of arms, then won over with shrewd diplomacy, and finally rewarded with the rich plunder of war. However, for the companions of the Prophet in battle, who had already vigorously complained about their small share from the plunder, it was now even more important than after the death of the Prophet, the religious message of Islam was not completely sold out to the Qurashi aristocracy of merchants and warriors. Long before Muhammad, their main interest was the economic and political control of the greater part of Arabia. But after the joint subjugations by the Meccans and Medinans under the leadership of the first caliphs, a renewed emphasis on the religious aspect of Arabic politics was particularly urgent. A specifically Islamic policy was called for. Islamic Politics Omar the Second Caliph People learned from the crisis after the death of the Prophet. So before his death in 634, the first Caliph Abu Bakr nominated a specific successor. Although a Meccan, unlike the aristocrats of Mecca, this successor seemed to guarantee the continuation of the religiously motivated politics of the Prophet. His name was Umar bin al-Khattab radiallahu anhu. Umar was one of the oldest of the Prophet's Meccan companions in battle who had taken part in the Hijrah. Like Abu Bakr, he had been a father-in-law through his daughter Hafsa of Muhammad and his constant advisor. He too had supported the election of Abu Bakr and had acted in constant agreement with the first caliph. He now proved to be an excellent leader and organizer and thus in every respect suited for the succession. Popular Western historical accounts like to suggest that the history of the first caliphs was a history only of intrigues, violent actions, and murder. This is not the case. Umar, like Abu Bakr before him, عنهما, became a successor to the Prophet in a peaceful consensus and largely fulfilled the expectations pinned on him in religion, politics, and military activities. The second caliph began by limiting the influence of the powerful Qurashi politicians. In both Medina and Mecca, he favored the most distinguished Sahaba of the Prophet and the Medinan helpers, Ansar. He gave them posts as governors, military commands, and administrative positions with the highest salaries. The earlier the conversion to Islam, the higher the payment and allowed them to put their own use, plunder, which really belonged to the community. 
At the same time, he attempted as far as possible to limit the involvement of the Qurashi elite in the new campaigns of conquest. He called himself not only Khalifat Rasulullah or Khalifat Allah, like Abu Bakr, but also Amir al-Mu'mineen, commander of the faithful. In this way, he combined the new authority of the supreme head of the Muslim community with the traditional authority of the elected tribal leader. Finally, he introduced the specifically Islamic reckoning of time after the Hijrah, A.H. This was constantly to bring to mind the bond between the conquered territories and the original community and to banish the old Qurashi history into the dark age of idolatry now past. This must have added to the offense taken by the leading Meccans at the political course of the second caliph. They therefore attempted in their own way to gain influence in the newly conquered territories. Indeed, in the long run, they could not be avoided, since the conquered territories were enormous. A shift of political balance from the desert to cultivated areas began to become evident here. The political center of gravity of the original Islamic community was increasingly formed by the desert cities of Mecca and Medina, the political and military ambitions and operations of the generation of the Prophet's companions were initially still concentrated in the Arabian Peninsula. The internal union and renewal of Arab society was at first in the foreground. However, the more Muslims came into contact and confrontation with the cultivated land of the great empires, the more the current leadership of the original community had to concentrate on newly conquered provinces. Syria, Iraq, and Egypt. Thus, external expansion was also increasingly governed. Uh, it also increasingly governed the development of early Islamic rule. A question arises that is important for us, which scholars have given very different answers. What are the reasons for the amazing expansion of the Arabs from the desert into cultivated lands? And this is a, a long section that I'm going to skip. We cannot discover precisely how far Caliph Omar was personally a great organizer, but under his rule the conquered re regions were militarily safeguarded, financially and politically stabilized in respect of taxation, and had their legislation developed. However, the appointment of the judge, the Qadi, and some expansion of the doctrine of responsibilities and penal law were attributed to Omar only after the event to provide legitimacy. It's a very orientalist notion. In the conquered territories, the Muslims were not to assimilate to the inhabitants, but coexist with them as an elite military caste. Omar achieved the consolidation of this rule through the establishment of large military camps, Misr, plural Amsar, at important crossroads where the Bedouins were settled, first in tents and then in huts. This happened both through three completely new garrison cities at highly strategic points, Basra on the Persian Gulf, Kufa on the Euphrates, and Fustalt, the predecessor of present-day Cairo on the Nile, and through other larger or smaller garrison towns in the periphery of existing towns and suburbs or villages. Omar thought of it the utmost importance that his Arabs, who were possibly all too impressed by alien culture, should not be corrupted in their nature and alienated in their faith. The army was to keep itself in these military camps, or the lighter the latter garrison towns, divide the plunder, gather the zakat, and distribute supplies to fighters and administrators in accordance with particular rules. A Meccan, not an Islamic policy, Uthman III Caliph. In 644, Uthman bin Affan, Caliph from 644 to 656, is an ideal candidate for the reconciliation of the two tendencies, the Meccan and the Islamic within the Muslim community, was chosen as caliph. However, even today he remains a controversial figure that does not so much have to do with the fact for the first time the great wave of conquest diminished under his rule, Syria, Palestine, Lower Egypt, Iraq, and Western Persia already belonged to the Arab Empire. After he had conquered the remotest territories on the Persian Empire, above all Armenia, and made the first advances in North Africa along the Mediterranean coast be beyond Tripolis, which had been conquered under Omar in 643, Uthman evidently had no further ambitions in foreign policy. 
he evidently did not want to go down in history like his predecessor as the great conqueror. Rather, the third caliph is controversial because he is accused of having abandoned Omar's course and domestic policy, and at least in the second part of his 12 years in office of having given priority to the interests of his family, the Umayyads, and other rich Meccan families. A further element has to be added to the charge of nepotism. The centralization of administration and finances was accompanied by a standardization of the Qur'an, which was unwelcome to some. The book edition of the Qur'an by Uthman served to standardize the religion and centralize the political leadership. However, the leading scholar of classical Islamic theology, Joseph Yosef van S., he's an Orientalist, obviously, emphasizes that there was no controversy theology either in the time when the original community was forming or when it was expanding. Only from the period of confusion shortly before the fall of the Umayyads do we have clear references to the institution of disputations and the pur purposeful involvement of people who had been trained in them. Talking about like the Mu'tazila, Jahmiyya, um, Qadirites, and all those types of things that happened later. And Ali, the fourth caliph, disputed. Centralization often destroys the unity it seeks. The centralizing family policy of Caliph Uthman caused unrest, first among the Qur'an reciters, the Qurra in Kufa, and then in Egypt. In 656, the discontented gathered in Medina with a few hundred protesters from Fustat alone. The conflict heightened, crowds assembled before the Caliph's house, loudly accusing him of simony, and the embezzlement of state funds. Long negotiations followed, but finally the group from Egypt made short shrift of things. They stormed the house and murdered Uthman. Many were urgently concerned that Ali bin Abi Talib should be chosen as Uthman's successor. He had not seriously been taken into account in the election of the first and second caliphs because he was too young. In the election of the third caliph, he had worked in the electoral body for Uthman but at around 45 had still been too young by comparison with the almost 70-year-old Orthman. Now, however, a cousin and son-in-law of the Prophet, and one of the first to be converted in Mecca, he was elected Caliph. This was clearly on the basis not of a designation or of a hereditary claim, but of the will of those forces in Medina who wanted to restore the original Muslim elite to power in the face of Meccan aristocrats and their Syrian interests who had become all too powerful. Thus, despite a number of disputes, Ali became caliph. He proved to be a very capable, energetic man. He removed, to the great annoyance of the Umayyah family, various unsuitable governors who had been given grace and favor appointments by Uthman. He also reversed Uthman's centralized control of the income of the provinces and ensured a more equitable distribution of the income from taxation and the plunder from war. But Ali's election as caliph was marked by a fatal mistake. He had already discredited himself in the eyes of some by having himself elected with the support of Uthman's murderers instead of arresting them and punishing them. For many, the murder cried out for vengeance, for blood vengeance in good Arab style. The prime candidate for blood vengeance, Qisas, was a cousin of Uthman, the Umayyad Muawiyah ibn Abu Sufyan, the powerful Muslim governor of Syria with his headquarters in Damascus. His army had come too late to support Uthman, but he avoided paying homage after Ali's election and finally made objections to it with the backing of Syria and Egypt. He claimed that the election had been held by a minority without consulting the provincial nobles, as it appears the members of the Umayyad clan had, fed, had fled from Medina after Uthman's murder, and he demanded that the caliph's murderers be handed over and severely punished. In the famous Battle of the Camel near Basra, Ali defeated his opponents. Talha and Zubair fell. The prophet's widow, who according to an old Arab custom had encouraged her supporters from a camel, was taken prisoner and sent back to Medina. For a long time, she remained the last Muslim woman to exert such an influence on public affairs. Uh, that's debatable. 
The second act took place in 657. A much more dangerous opponent, the Umayyad Muawiyah with the Syrian army, fell upon Ali's troops at the upper Euphrates, east of Aleppo at Sophine. Despite weeks of skirmishing and minor battles, the clash proved indecisive. Finally, arbitration was agreed upon, agreed upon to clarify whether the murder of Uthman was justified or not. The third act took place in 659. After long negotiations and vigorous arguments, the arbitration, though reports of it are confused, decided for Muawiyah and thus for the election of a new caliph. That's debatable. Some of Ali's supporters, especially those old fighters for Islam who had long devoted their lives to the cause and received little thanks for it, felt deeply disillusioned. They thought that Ali had handed over Allah's cause to human arbitration and indirectly put his caliphate under human disposition. In theory, the opponents left the garrison towns of Basra and Kufa. These successionists, or Kharajites, Khawarij, from Kharaja to go out, to leave, gathered by Nahrawan Canal on the Tigris. There the caliph fell on the separated ones and decimated them. Thereafter, the Kharajites, originally Ali's most loyal followers, had become his most bitter enemies, with the result that the caliph had repeatedly to deal with these extremely aggressive apostates. One of their number finally took blood vengeance on the unfortunate caliph, fourth caliph. In 661, Ali was struck down at the door of a mosque in Kufa with a poisoned sword and died a painful death a few days later. This was the third murder of a caliph, and again, no problems had been solved. Since the middle of the 8th century, Ali's tomb in Nejef, and Nejef, a town south of Baghdad, a few miles west of Kufa, has been the crystallization point and central place of pilgrimage for the Shiites. A separate party. Ayatollah Khomeini, Khomeini, who was banished from Iran, taught at its theological high school from 1956 to 1978, and there prepared for the Islamic Revolution. Najaf became the center of Shiite resistance to the American occupation of Iraq between 2003 and 2004. From then until now, Muslims have remained split over Ali. He has given his name to an important party that still exists today, Ali's party, Shiat Ali. Today, called Shia for short, the Shiites believe that Ali was designated patron and supreme head, Imam of the Ummah, on his return from the farewell pilgrimage at the Pool of Khum in the 16th of March, 632, which later became the annual Shiite festival. However, the Sunni interpretation of the same prophetic saying is that Muhammad only wanted to protect Ali, who was too strict and therefore unpopular. Much must necessarily remain unexplained here because of the sources are obscure. One thing is certain, Muawiyah and with him the Umayyads remained the victor. In 600 after the arbitration, the governor of Syria had homage paid to him as caliph in the holy city of Jerusalem. I think by homage here he means bay'ah. Piously praying on Golgotha in the garden of Gethsemane and the tomb of Mary. After the murder of Ali, his caliphate was recognized almost everywhere and become the first of another paradigm of Islam. What had been from the beginning a simmering dispute over the succession of the prophet, the justification for leadership of the ummah, and the question of legitimizing Islamic rule, now irredeeming, irredeemably broke out. What was to be decisive for the succession in the future, former service of Islam, Sabiqa, or genealogical proximity to the prophet Nesib and his family? That was the main question. The unity of the Ummah broke apart over three different theories of the caliphate and concepts of rule. And I'm going to stop there because you should be familiar with all the rest, but that is in summation a lot of what we covered in this course. And I hope that with that reading you can see kind of how see better now the modern elements in Orientalist discourse that need to be rejected by pious Muslims. And here we'll get to the uh, citation style. So this is the rubric that I'm going to use for grading your papers. I want to be fully 
transparent and um, forthcoming with all of you regarding the final paper and what it is that I'm looking for. So I'm going to go over this with you. Um, four means like the highest level. Um, and so like each one, two, three, four is going to be 2.5% of your final grade. So um, talking about quality of information and evidence. What I'm looking for is I want your paper to be well researched from the primary sources and engaging with whatever secondary sources, secondary sources you decide to engage with. Um, if you need help finding primary or secondary sources, please feel free to reach out to me. There are a lot of PDFs available online on the internet. You can Google Library Genesis and it's a place where you can get free PDFs. There's also many Facebook groups where you can ask for free PDFs of books and scholarly articles. And like I said, if you need help, just ask me and I can try to get it for you. And we also want detailed and historically accurate information that relates to the arguments that you're being made, the refutations that you're making against the Orientalists. The student clearly argues about what is truth, capital T, truth, al-haq, what is evidence, and thinking about how one thinks, which is epistemology, and refuted Orientalist epistemologies or worldviews. The paper is clear and logical in nature. There is a thorough development of ideas and demonstrates the student has progressed in their knowledge in the class. I want to see that you learn something, that you're different from how you started with this class. Demonstrated that you learned how to think in a new critical manner and you learned how to kind of dispel these Orientalist misconceptions. And then last is the citation format. I give it um, some, uh, you know, level of points here, 10% of your final grade, because in academic writing, how you cite things is quite important because the whole point of the citation is to show where you got your information so you're not plagiarizing. And you have to show where you got your information in a way that people can easily find it. That means the author of the book, the title of the book, which edition is it? Is it third edition, fourth edition, fifth edition? How many volumes is the book? What city it was published in? The name of the publishing house? and the year that it was published. All of this can be found on the title page and copyright page. Usually you have the title page and the copyright page is just on the other side. Um, it's usually right at the beginning of the book. Some Arabic books, they don't always have a date or place or publishing house. Um, so we'll get into that, how to deal with that a little bit later. But um, citations are important because the idea is for people to go and find that section of the book and benefit. And so you want to tell people where you got this information so they can go do further reading and research if they'd like. And so that means you must cite the page number for all references. That is absolutely critical to academic writing. And in graduate school, it's absolutely required. Um, here, I do require it because I want you to get used to that. Um, you know, the page number where you got your information. And how to add footnotes, don't be intimidated by it. It's actually very easy. Um, with Microsoft Word, you just go to the References tab and there's a big, huge button that says Insert Footnote and it automatically does it for you and it automatically numbers everything to the correct numbering. And then Google Docs, you go to <clears throat> Insert Footnote. So it's pretty easy no matter what kind of word processor you're using. And then there's this uh, interesting book here, The Footnote. Uh, Curious History by Anthony Grafton. It's just something fun if you want to go read on your own time and you can know what the footnote's all about. But it is the standard to use the Chicago style footnote citation in history. But uh, pretty much all of the humanities, even some of the social sciences use it like anthropology and whatnot. So 
it's pretty important to know most uh, Islamic authors that are doing research, uh, sheikhs and imams or ulama, those types of things, they use the Chicago format. Um, even if they're writing completely in Arabic, they're often using a variation of the Chicago format of citation. So it's really important to know it and uh, get familiar with it. It's really not that hard to learn, so don't be intimidated by it. It just takes a little bit of practice and you will catch on very quickly. And so this is what your citation should look like. Um, so the first time that you introduce a new book is what this will look like right here. So you have the name of the author, first and last name, the title of the book in italics, the city that the book is published in, the name of the publishing house, the year that it's published, and the page numbers that you consulted. And here's just another example where it has two authors, a title and a subtitle, and it's relatively the same. And then when you mention that book again in another note, you merely have to just mention the last name, uh, the main title, and the page number. So here it's just Curious Mind, instead of mentioning the whole subtitle, you just put the main title. And for journal articles, it's a little bit more you mention the first last name, the name of the article in uh, quotations, the name of the journal in italics, and uh, maybe the volume of the journal, and then sometimes they have numbers after the volume. So it could be volume 111, and they have a number one, two, three, and four. Um, so this one's this issue is number two, and then you could put uh, you know the year, or even some people put the month or the season, and then last the page number after. Uh, colon there and uh, you can also add the DOI which is kind of like ISBN it's just a code to locate that academic article and it's also a link that you can put in that will take you to that article um, so adding that is just extra icing on the cake um, typically it's considered required if you consulted the article online and then you might want to put like uh, what date you accessed the article as well and then um, when you, this is when you mention it the first time in your text when you mention it again in another footnote um, you just got the last name um, maybe a shortened version of the article name and uh, page numbers there and uh, this link down here uh, will give you some more details about the Chicago method um, if you don't get the PDF of the book and here are just some more examples um, using like Arabic. Um, here I put the edition, fourth edition, that it's two volumes. Um, so we have the city of Riyadh. The publishing house is Dar al Malik. Oh, that A is not supposed to be there. So Dar al Malik, Abdul Aziz. Year it was published was 1982. And then volume one, colon, and page number. And this one's Mus'ab al Zubairi, Nasab Quraysh. And it's edited by this French Orientalist, Evariste Levi Provençal, and um, published in Cairo. So you put the English spelling of the Arabic city, and then Dar al Ma'arif is the publishing house, and it has no date on it. We don't know what year it was published. There's no date in the copyright page. So you just put N.D for no date. If there's no place, you would put N.P. If there's no publishing house, you also put N.P. So N.P could stand for no place or no publishing house, depending on which side of this colon you put it on. And then you have the page number at the end. These are the short, shortened uh, versions for if you mention it again in your text. And here is some more examples of articles and the DOI and um, having an access date is uh, important. And um, then these are kind of the shortened um, versions of it down here. And that's basically essentially it. Um, I want to wish you luck, or as we say in Islam, tawfiq, on your final exam and final paper. يوافقكم الله جميعا May Allah grant you all divine providence Ameen And with that I will bid you all adieu 
Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu.